Okay, thanks again. Uh, <clears throat> my task is to talk about thermodilution technique to estimate cardiac output. Uh, my list of disclosures are not changed. Uh, this is my email. You'll find it also in the material. Anybody who would like to get a copy of this lecture, please, within two weeks, send me an email, and I'll send you a copy of the lecture. I uh, owe special thanks to Daniel Reuter from Hamburg. Uh, this is a, uh, a review article soon to be published in Anesthesia and Algesia, and you can see the topic, cardiac output monitoring using indicator dilution techniques, basic limits and perspectives, and I drew uh, heavily from uh, this manuscript. So that starts with Adolf Fick. Uh, we know that he uh, uh, developed the FIC formula, a way to uh, indirectly measure cardiac output from uh, oxygen consumption. And he said it is astonishing that no one has arrived at the following obvious method by which the amount of blood ejected by the ventricle of the heart with each systole may be determined directly. And about 30 years later, Stewart injected a bolus of sodium chloride into the central venous <coughs> circulation of anesthetized dogs and rabbits, and then collected blood samples containing diluted sodium chloride from a femoral artery mm -hmm. catheter, and there was an electric transducer on the contralateral mm -hmm. femoral artery that sensed the arrival of the diluted injectate. So a cardiac output measurement that, uh, by, by indicator dilution has three phases. The indicator is brought into the circulation, the injection. The indicator mixes in the bloodstream, that is mixing a dilution, and the concentration is determined downstream, i.e. detection. Now, contrary to his own observation, Stewart assumed in his formula that the indicator concentration at the collection site rises and declines in a stepwise manner and this is why you can see in the denominator of his formula just one concentration of the sodium. And a few years later, Hamilton introduced uh, the concept of an explicit time concentration curve. And this has become uh, what we all know as the Stewart-Hamilton formula, which is a time concentration curve in which the cardiac output uh, is calculated as the amount of injected indicator uh, divided by the area uh, of the dilution curve. And this technique using endocyanin green as indicator and continuous withdrawal of blood into a sensing cuvette was the conventional indicator dilution method used to measure cardiac output in critically ill patients until the 70s. And not many people in the room, I guess, have done that, but uh, <coughs> some of us did. So what about the thermodilution method? Well, the thermodilution method adapts the indicator dilution principle to injectate that cause changes in blood temperature that is diluted downstream. An injectate of known volume and temperature is injected in the right atrium. And the cool blood traverses a thermistor in a major vessel branch downstream over a duration of time. And again, cardiac output is inversely proportional to the mean blood temperature depression and the duration of the transit of the cooled blood, i.e. the area under the curve. And with the introduction of the pulmonary artery catheter, note that the first paper was about the uh, uh, flow uh, directed the balloon tipped catheter in 1970 and a year later, uh, a new technique for measurement of cardiac output. So following the introduction of the PA catheter, the single bolus thermal dilution measurement of cardiac output has been widely accepted as the clinical standard for advanced hemodynamic monitoring. And in fact, it's still considered to be the clinical gold standard against which new technologies are validated and compared. And indeed, this is why uh, this lecture may not be the most exciting one, but certainly it is very important in this uh, program because so many uh, other techniques are being compared to the thermal dilution method. So we have to know or remind ourselves rather uh, what are the uh, mainly the limitations of this methodology. So this is the PA catheter and of course you introduce a cold injectate that causes a rapid upslope to a peak, a gradual downslope and an exponential decay. 
the cardiac output computer begins the integration of the area under the thermal dilution curve until the exponential decay reaches a value about 30 percent and extrapolate the exponential decay to baseline in order to minimize artifact due to recirculation of the indicator. So let's start looking at what are the sources of measurement error and variability of the pulmonary trans uh, thermal dilution technique. And first of all, we can mention loss of indicator prior to injection, because when the actual amount of cold injectate that enter the circulation is less than the assumed quantity, then the mean blood temperature depression <coughs> would be smaller and uh, cardiac output uh, would be overestimated. And this happens when we have inaccurate filling of syringes or occult warming of the cold indicator prior to injection. Now we can lose the indicator also during injection and the factors that determine this loss include the intraluminal surface area, the dead space of the catheter, the injected volume, the temperature uh, gradient, and the injection rate. <coughs> the dissipation of the cold through the warm intravascular portion of the catheter can be partially circumvented by measuring, measuring the temperature of the injected just immediately before entering the catheter and employing a corrective catheter specific computation constant and some people recommend that the first measurement be discarded because this is where the dead space is warmest and may be uh, least accurate. Then we can lose the indicator after injection and this is by conductive rewarming of the indicator by the surrounding tissue. This is more pronounced in low flow state and is more pronounced in the transpulmonary thermal dilution that I'll talk about later because of the longer distance of the, uh, that the injectate travel. The heat loss can lead to falsely elevated cardiac outputs. Diversion of the cold indicator from its normal itinerary, like in right to left intracardiac shunt, venous venous uh, extracorporeal lung assist devices, or certain instances of tricuspid regurgitation may also cause falsely elevated cardiac output. What about the temperature and the volume? When room temperature uh, is used, the less indicator is lost, but the initial thermal signal is smaller than with iced injectate, and it may magnify uh, the relative effect of loss of indicator. Room temperature is less accurate in low and high flow state, and it is agreed, I think, that the highest reproducibility of cardiac output by pulmonary thermal dilution in a critically ill patient was demonstrated with uh, uh, iced uh, injectate. We heard about the cyclic changes in the cardiac output during spontaneous and mechanical ventilation, and they may affect uh, the cardiac output that is measured because the stroke <coughs> volume varies sometimes quite significantly uh, due to respiratory movement. Now, <clears throat> Although the cardiac output measurements uh, are most reproducible when performed at the same point in the respiratory cycle, the averaging of multiple measurements at different phases of the re respiratory cycle is recommended. As you can see, there are a lot more, maybe more important or less important, sources of uh, measurement error and variability. Certainly, you have to look at the thermal dilution curve during the inject during, uh, immediately after the injection, and again, the principle is that uh, you want to look at the area, the dilution curve, and it will give you a, uh, a qualitative uh, um, idea about the size of the cardiac output. It's very important to look at the uh, curve in order to find some artifacts because of uh, a wrong injection or something like that. Now, this is <clears throat> Very important now to understand the limitation of this uh, technology because, as I said, it serves as a gold standard. And they, this is in 1982 already. The intrinsic limits of the reproducibility of pulmonary thermal dilution require a measured change of approximately 22% or 30% if you use triplicate measures for the difference to be statistically significant. <clears throat> this may not be the most important journal, but uh, this paper is quoted a lot, the Critchley and Critchley, and they say that the acceptance of a new method for the measurement of cardiac output 
should be judged against this plus minus 10 to 20 percent accuracy of the current reference method that is thermodilution. And consequently, excuse me, they recommend that the limits of agreement between a new and a reference technique is up to 30 percent be accepted. Now, just to show you how important this is, uh, this is a very recent uh, um, uh, review by, uh, by Maurizio Cecconi, Andy Rhodes, and, and others, Giorgio De La Rocca, and they repeat, again, what maybe some people don't, don't know or certainly don't include in their papers, that, again, that the uh, precision, the assumed precision of the thermal dilution curve is about plus minus 20 percent, that the combination of this precision with the precision of the new technique equates a total error of about 30 percent, and that this 30 percent indeed is used very often as a cutoff in order to validate a new technique. But the comparisons of study, the comparison study should report the precision of the reference technique, and this is sometimes not being reported but only assumed. So it because it may either be more precise or less precise than normally expected. So if you have a more if you have a more precise technique, it may lead to an unjustified validation of an unacceptably imprecise new technique. And if you have a less precise reference technique, it may lead to an unjustifiable rejection of an acceptably precise new technique. So what are the advantages of pulmonary thermal dilution? It is the standard method for cardiac output measurement, good correlation with earlier methods, simple measurement, repeated measures. The uh, pulmonary artery catheter may provide continuous cardiac output, and also it provides PA pressure, wedge pressure, mixed venous oxygen saturation, and optionally right ventricular and diastolic volume and ejection fraction. The limitations are the intrinsic limitation of reproducibility of the measurement, the inherent limits on the frequency and number of measurement, complications that are associated with the placement and presence of the PA catheter, and that the PAC-based continuous cardiac output <coughs> is not a real-time signal, it's an average signal, and therefore uh, may be uh, uh, less useful uh, during uh, hemodynamic changes. Now, this is the other uh, thermal dilution technique, it's the transpulmonary thermal dilution technique used in the PICO, and you can see here that uh, the, um, the patient has a CVP and has a thermistor-tipped catheter that is placed in a large artery, femoral, axillary, brachial, or in case of the radial artery, then a long radial artery. Again, there is an injection into the right atrium and the sensing of the thermal dilution curve in the thermistor that lies in a systemic artery. Now, if we look at the thermal dilution curves of pulmonary thermal dilution and transpulmonary, after one injection, you can see that the pulmonary thermal dilution, of course, would appear earlier, would have a higher peak, and the transpulmonary would appear later, would have a smaller peak. I would not go into the validation study, <clears throat> this is again from um, the coming paper of, uh, of Dr. Reuter, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, most uh, or nearly all um, studies that compare pulmonary to transpulmonary thermal dilution find a very good uh, agreement and correlation. I'll just bring this very recent study in patient with severe left ventricular dysfunction, and again, you can see uh, the relationship between pulmonary thermal dilution with a PA catheter and transpulmonary thermal dilution with a PICO monitor. This, I think, is a very nice study. This is in children comparing femoral artery thermal dilution, that is uh, the, uh, the PICO system, with a FIC principle in children showing that, indeed, this technology can be used to measure cardiac output even in small children. Again, it is important to uh, look at the curve. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Frédéric Michaud is here uh, in the audience, and here a very nice uh, two cases showing this hump during the thermal dilution curve that tells you that there is a, a patent foramen of valor with the right to left shunt, and indeed when the pulmonary vascular resistance is uh, 
decreased either by nitric oxide or by the removal of PEEP, you can see that this uh, artifact uh, disappears. And this, uh, again, a case report showing that when the uh, thermostop tipped arterial catheter and is adjacent to a femoral venous catheter that is used for the injection rather than an uh, internal jugular uh, vein, then you can have an artifact because the uh, arterial sensor senses immediately during the injection, and this, of course, is a wrong thing to do. Sources of measurement error and variability. The transparent thermal dilution is measured over a longer duration of time. It reflects left ventricular output, and as a result, it is less affected by the cold-induced transient lowering of the heart rate during cold indicator injection. I don't know how much important that is, but certainly uh, it has been described, and it is less affected by respiratory variation. The longer distance between injection and sampling site may theoretically increase uh, indicator loss, but it was found that about 96, 97, most of the indicator that reaches the pulmonary artery is recovered in the aorta. Um, indicator loss may be increased when in a patient with pulmonary edema that has a lot of lung water, and then you are prompted by the PICA monitor to increase the injectate volume to compensate for that. Uh, <clears throat> the PICO also offers a continuous cardiac output by the pulse contour method. This again has been uh, correlated, validated against the pulmonary thermodilution cardiac output. We do need real-time uh, cardiac, continuous cardiac output measurement. We'll talk about this uh, later on or tomorrow, but certainly when you do fluid loading, or when you give inotropes, when you give passive leg raising, when you do passive leg raising, you want a continuous real-time uh, cardiac output measurement, I'll just give an example where the rate of the uh, pacemaker is changed and you can see that the cardiac output is going up and certainly with a PA catheter continuous cardiac output, this cannot be done. Uh, there, PICO applies also an advanced indicator dilution curve analysis. Uh, this was already mentioned. You can see here the two uh, uh, period, the mean transit time, and the downslope time, and with these, without going into too many details, then uh, uh, parameters like the global end diastolic volume and extravascular <coughs> lung water can be computed from this single uh, thermal dilution. Just think of the first formula, the intrathoracic thermal volume is the cardiac output times the mean transit time, so if you imagine a cardiac output divided by the mean transit time, it will give you the distribution volume from the injection to the detection point. This is the, the principle. So the advantages of transpulmonary thermal dilution has a good correlation with pulmonary thermal dilution, less invasive than the PA catheter and avoids the risk of PA catheter. Most critically ill patients have a CVP and an A-line anyway. Simple measurement, repeated measurement, less influenced by respiratory variation, real-time calibrated continuous cardiac output with stroke volume variation, and the provision of several other important parameters, we'll talk about them, them tomorrow, like global end diastolic uh, volume and extravascular lung water, and it may be used in children. The limitation of transporting thermal dilution, again, the inherent methodological and statistical limitations as the pulmonary thermal dilution, the complications that are assess, associated with placement and presence of, the, of the, a central line and a large arterial line, smaller temperature changes that necessitate steady baseline temperature and the use of cold injectate, especially when lung water is increased, inherent limits on the frequency and number of measurement, and of course it does not provide PA pressure and SVO2. My conclusions. The thermal dilution method is the clinical global standard for the measurement of cardiac output. Both pulmonary and transpulmonary thermal dilution are practically equal in their accuracy. Each of these techniques offers additional information beside the cardiac output, and therefore the choice of monitoring technique is largely influenced by the additional information that is offered and by the presumed uh, uh, morbidity of each of these techniques. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Reuter again and thank you for your attention.